Hello, and welcome everyone to the next event in our webinar series, a presentation by Thor Labs' Carol Borsa on galvanometers, the selection and integration process. My name is Brian Candeloro, Director of Engineering for Galvo Systems at Thor Labs. I will be moderating today's webinar. Carol Borsa has been with Thor Labs since a merge that occurred in 2020 and is the subject matter expert for the galvanometer product line. Within this role, Carol guides customers in choosing catalog galvanometers that best fit their applications. She additionally works with customizations and alternative configurations for projects that have specific requirements within both R&D and OEM environments. Throughout Carol's talk, please feel free to submit any questions you have using the Q&A tool. Carol will be answering those questions at the end. And at this time, I'd like to hand the talk off to Carol. Hi, everybody. Brian, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for taking the time to join me today. My name is Carol Borsa and I'm an account manager here at Thor Labs. As mentioned, I specialize in our galvanometer beam steering devices. Our product line has been with Thor Labs for about two and a half years now, but I've been with the Galvo Systems since 2017. And before that, my initial introduction to galvanometers was in 2014, which doesn't feel like nine years ago, but apparently it was, and I didn't realize that until I started calculating it for the purposes of this talk. Uh, hopefully, you know why you're here, but in case you just wandered in off the internet, uh, the purpose of us getting together is to help folks like yourselves who may be considering integrating Galvos into your systems become more familiar with the devices and provide some information on the sorts of questions that you may need to consider when you're selecting a solution that's going to be right for you. So a little about us. Thor Labs manufactures a majority of our Galvos at our 30,000 square foot facility in London, Derry, New Hampshire. For those of you who are not super familiar with the geography of the Northeastern United States, we're about an hour north of Boston, depending on how traffic is that day, which is pretty hit or miss. If you've ever been to Boston, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the um, this is where we wind all of our own coils and then we build those up into the rotors of our systems. This is also where we perform the final assembly and do all of the service for these parts. Uh, you can see a picture here of one of our many coil winding machines. They asked for a picture of our building, but a gray office building in New England winter is super boring and coil winding is so much cooler. So we went with that instead. Um, we do keep more than 60 common configurations on the shelves at our warehouse in Newton, New Jersey. But Galvos are incredibly configurable devices, so it would be a bit impractical for us to keep all of the possible co combinations in stock. However, our US-based manufacturing and assembly does allow us to also easily tailor make non-standard configurations for people who need something that's slightly different than what we have immediately available in the catalog. Uh, speaking of the catalog, we do have a large selection of beam steering products in our catalog and discussing all of them would take significantly longer than the time that we have together today. So I am just going to be focusing on our open frame QS series of Galvos as well as our two axis and our three axis packaged scan heads that, that you can see here on the left side of our screen. On the right over here, we do also offer flexure galvo systems, as well as our blank high-speed focusing module, both of which are here on the right. These two products by themselves could be their own separate webinars. <laughs> so while they are part of our family and they get, they get a salute, I'm not going to get too in-depth about them today. If you are interested in a separate webinar on either of these systems, please let us know either by email or drop something into the chat on this presentation or give us customer feedback on the individual product pages via the feedback tab. Uh, it's always helpful for us to hear what products customers are looking for more information on or seeking additional resources for. 
Uh, if you have more immediate questions about those products specifically, uh, strongly encourage you to reach out to the Thor Labs support team, tech support at thorlabs.com. There's going to be a link posted in the additional resources section of your view that you can use to navigate to the entire Galvo product family on thorlabs.com. But if you can't find that, you can easily get to where you need to go by just going to the search bar and typing Galvo into the search bar on the Thor Labs website. You'll find us. Um, a majority of the conversations that I have surrounding any of these products uh, begin with the title of my next slide, which is, tell me about your application. It is my favorite fact finding, not really a question question. And I never cease to be impressed by the new and creative and innovative ways that customers come up with to integrate our systems, as well as the cutting edge technologies that use Galvos. But most of the applications I end up talking about fall into one of three basic categories. The first is laser processing of materials which covers a group of primarily more industrial applications like parking or welding, um, laser micro machining, micro hole drilling, and then the newest application in this space is additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Additive 3D is a bit different because all of the other applications that fall under this heading involve the removal of material. Well, additive is all about building a finished good layer by layer, but it is still processing a material, so it still gets categorized underneath laser processing. Uh, in this picture over here on the left, you can see an excellent example of a laser processing system that was built by one of our customers. And this incorporates a two axis package scan head with the F theta objective lens on it that's integrated into this really cool multi-axis marking machine that has this little turntable down here um, and this gantry style fixturing that allows the head to rotate around the part. Uh, it's an example of a, a complex, but very cool integration. Not all integrations are that complicated, but this is, this is a really great example of one that's kind of next level. Uh, the second application category that we have our products fall under is imaging. And this is the application that a lot of existing Floral Labs customers are already so familiar with. These are microscopy applications like OCT or LightSheet. LightSheet is how this beautiful image of a mouse cortex from the Dean Lab down at UT Southwestern was taken, as well as multi-photon, confocal, all sorts of super fancy microscopes. Also under the imaging heading are any of the LIDAR applications, systems used for surveying, geography, laser guidance, um, autonomous driving systems are really something that gets talked about a lot these days. Uh, these are the applications where you're going to be getting inbound data off of the sample surface, and they frequently evolve a lot of other devices, such as cameras, in order to interpret some of that data that comes back. And that brings us to our third category, which is medical. Medical gets its own separate section because it's a little bit of both of the previous applications. It's a little bit laser processing and it's a little bit imaging. The imaging systems are sometimes diagnostic, sometimes they're research and development devices that are used for discovery, or sometimes they're used for determining treatment options for patients. Um, occasionally diagnostics, um, but on the processing side of things, we have sort of two sub branches of that, and that's going to be the first is medical device manufacturing, which is more traditional materials processing, but med device manufacturing has their own much more strict set of requirements for their devices, which does give them a sort of unique set of properties that they need. And then in addition to device manufacturing, the other laser processing that you get in medical is, is surgical or dermatological applications, which, which are still laser processing of materials. But the material you're processing happens to be a person and sometimes people don't like being referred to as materials. So we break them out into just the medical category. Um, and then there's also, I, I, didn't, I didn't get any images of this one up here on the slide, but the other, 
fourth category that is new or cool, and I, so I don't have any fancy images for it yet, uh, is going to be quantum computing. And this is something that's completely wild, and I don't pretend to understand the full implementation of our devices into these systems, uh, but it's a burgeoning field, it's an interesting field, and there's a lot of really cool things happening in that space. So if you fall into one of these three or four categories, then you are probably in the right place. If you don't fall into one of these categories, but you still want to use a Galvo, uh, give me a call, because I want to hear about whatever weird thing you're doing. <laughs> so now let's get into the reason that you actually came, the reason you guys showed up today, and start talking about the parts of the Galvo system. I like to start any sort of an educational session with establishing a basic glossary of terms. There are several different parts of a Galvo system that all are frequently lumped in together under the generic term of Galvo. But each of these parts does have its, its own specific terminology. And I wanna make sure we all have the same frame of reference moving forward so we all know what we're talking about together. The term galvanometer is technically just the motor or the rotor <laughs> that's encased in this silver body here. Uh, this is the wire coil along with the magnets, bearings, a position detector. We have three different galvo motor sizes in our catalog currently. It seems like there are more of them because of the number of mirror sizes and coding options that we have available. But really, it's just it's just three for now. The size of the motor you end up with is likely going to be determined by the size of the optic that you need and the speed that you need to move that optic at. Uh, speaking of the optic, it's uh, pretty straightforward. <laughs> In all of the catalog products and most of the custom models that we build, the optic is just like this one here. It's a mirror. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, you can mount just about any sort of a balanced load onto a Galvo. And we have, we've mounted some wild stuff. As long as the inertial load is going to be low enough that the rotor can safely and effectively move the mass without becoming damaged. And the substrate of the optic is durable enough to handle being moved at Galvo speeds without breaking typically pretty fine. And then when we talk about the size of the mirror, that's another thing that we like to just briefly touch on. We're referring to the diameter of the laser beam that can be accommodated by the mirror through its full rated excursion of plus minus 22 and a half degrees optical. So for example, when we say that a unit has a 10 millimeter mirror, the mirror is actually much larger than 10 millimeters, but a 10 millimeter beam can be deflected by the mirror at any of the scan angles without falling off the edge or being clipped so that you would lose some of your laser power or end up with straight laser power kind of exiting the system, which is undesirable. This is also the reason that these Galvo mirrors have kind of the unique geometry that they have with these chamfers cut out of the sides. And I will get more into this a bit later on. See, now you have a reason to stick around. <laughs> this is, but for now, we're gonna keep going on with terms. The servo amplifiers are next, which are these ones right here at number three. And this is far and away the single component that has the most confusion surrounding it. It, it has the most synonyms. <laughs> they are sometimes called the drivers the electronics or the control electronics, the amps, the servos. Um, I could keep going, but I think you guys get the idea. The only one of these terms that I really don't like for the servo amplifiers is controllers. We normally reserve that term for the device that's being used to generate command signals, such as a digital Galvo controller or an analog waveform generator or a serial DAC. Uh, at any rate, not these boards. <laughs> Every servo amplifier is tuned for use with its specific mated Galvo. All of our catalog systems do come paired with their mated servo amplifier. If you are 
using more than one Galvo. It is strongly recommended that you triple check that the serial number that's going to be notated on the bottom of your board does match the corresponding Galvo, because if you operate a Galvo with a non-matched servo amplifier, you can you can damage some of your hardware. So save, your, save yourself the headache and just check this, check the serial numbers real quick. These last two are much, much easier. So four and five. Uh, the mounting block here at number four, uh, pretty straightforward machined aluminum mounting block. All of our two axis open frame systems come pre-aligned and match tuned in a mounting block like this one pictured. It is worth mentioning as a component in the systems though, because the mirrors also come in a mount. <laughs> but when we are talking about a two axis system, the mirror mount is normally not what we're discussing. Or if we're talking about mounting the Galvos, we're not normally talking about the mirror mounts. Usually it's mounting the whole, the whole Galvo into, into a larger system or onto an optical table. So if what you want to discuss is mirror mounts, if you want to chat, chat about mirror mounts, just make sure that we're both talking about the same sort of mount. <laughs> and then lastly here at number five are the cables. So these are the cables that run between the servo amplifiers and the Galvo motors themselves. All of our systems come with a standard set of 24 inch cables. If your particular application is going to require additional distance between the motors and the servo amplifiers, you should reach out to Thor Labs Tech Support to discuss that further before attempting to make longer cables. Increasing the distance between the servos and the motor uh, over 36 inches can have consequences on system performance and can damage the hardware if if severe enough. So you should definitely plan to discuss that prior to just trying to splice in an extra cable length or just make longer cables. So something for consideration. And then the other cables that are not included when you purchase a system, but they get talked about fr frequently, are going to be the interface cables that run between the servo amplifier and either the power supply or your waveform generator whatever you're using for command. So data and power cables. Pre-made sets of those cables are available on thorlabs.com for purchase. If you want to take the easy route of just buying something, if you want to make your own set of custom cables to your specifications, all of our open frame systems do ship with a kit of connectors included. So you can make your own cables if you want. It's got the connector, it's got the pins. All you need is you know the, the wire and some crimpers. It is important to remember if you are making your own cables that all of the connections should be soldered and they need to be properly shielded. Alligator style clamps, bare connections are insufficient for Galva systems. They represent opportunities for EM noise to enter the system and noise is the uh, natural enemy of Galva systems in the wild. So it should be avoided. So now let's move on to uh, where the Galvas are located. It is likely that if you are here attending this, you already have a rough idea of where Galvos would be located and going are going to reside in your beam path. However, in case you are not sure, I wanted to take a quick moment to go over a couple of examples of basic setups. In this picture here on the left, you can see an example of a laser marking system where the package scan head that we, we've done a little open view of is connected to a central system controller that also connects to a PC and the laser. The scan head is also connected to its own dedicated power supply. Occasionally there are other conditioning optics in between the laser and the scan head input. And we just put a little beam expander in here because beam expander is probably the most common one. And But regardless of what's in between, the scan head is generally located pretty, pretty late in the beam path in these sorts of setups. Really the only thing that's between the, the scan head and the, 
the work surface or the material that you're going to be processing is going to be this objective lens or like an F-theta lens if you need to get a focused beam or a focused spot. On this other image, the galvanometers are also located before the scan lenses. But this is more of a, an inbound beam type where I was talking about before with an imaging system where the laser is hitting a sample and data is then also being collected from there. There will potentially be a significant number of other optical components in the beam path for these sorts of set setups. In this diagram, you can see there's a scan lens, there's another tube lens right here, there's another dichroic or mirror, and then finally the objective lens down here before you actually get to the sample. Regardless of the application, Galvo systems typically fall into one of two categories. Both of the ones that I've detailed here are pre-objective scanning systems where the Galvos are located in the beam path before the focusing ones. In a post-objective scanning system, the XY mirrors are placed after the final focusing lens. You can read more about this type of post-objective scanning on the product page for our three axis package scan heads. There's a little two axis versus three axis tab right at the top of the page. It does vary slightly from pre-objective systems because the focal plane is more dynamic and it can shift in these sorts of systems. So definitely worth checking out. Really interesting information. Take a look if, you, if you've got the time. So now that we are all speaking the same language and you know where your galvas are gonna be, let's start at asking the big questions. The first major question that you should ask yourself when choosing a galvo is how many axes do you need to move your laser beam through? If you're looking for a single axis, like a raster scan, that's really easy. You can move right along to the other concerns in your system, such as choosing the right optic, and then start thinking about things like mounting options and lenses and all of those other fun things. If you are looking to deflect the beam through two or even three axes, then you need to ask yourself what level of integration you are looking to take on. And at this point, it is all about finding a balance between the ease of integration and the flexibility of the system. So our two axis open frame heads that you see right here in the middle are already mounted, they're aligned, they're match tuned, so they're linearized. However, if the mounting block that they come in does not fit in your system, or if you are looking to build into an existing footprint, or if you have the need to place another optic in between the two scanning mirrors, this might not be the best option for you because it is less flexible. If you require flexibility, if you need to do any of those things that I just mentioned, you can option, opt to purchase two single axis galvos and integrate those into your own mounting structure. Uh, frequently, as a, as a special, we will get customers that approach us and want, you know, can I just buy, can I just buy an X and a Y, but not in the mounting block? So we do specials like that fairly frequently. If the mounting block does fit into your system and you don't have any of those needs that I just mentioned, uh, then the two axis open frame heads are a great way to skip some of those engineering steps that I just talked about where you need to think about things like mirror alignment and linearity and making sure the mirrors don't crash together when you're moving them, which we strongly recommend against mirror crashes bad. <laughs> they are easier to integrate. If you can opt for an open frame system, you can move ahead to designing an enclosure if you need one or deciding how you're going to heat the sink the servo amplifiers or choosing the other optomac that's going to hold this open frame head on your optical table or whatever um so, so this is a little bit easier but again the footprint's not really going to be able to change much from from what it is currently easier to integrate still but less flexible are these package scan heads that you see right here. And I actually, uh, I brought visual aids for this one. So these are the most plug and play option 
player, at least as plug and play as you get when you're talking about a complex laser system. The galvos in these heads are mounted. They are aligned like you get in an open frame system, but we take it one step further and put everything neatly into a box. The servo amplifiers are nested together and affixed to a heat sink. We've connected everything to a digital, digital day analog receiver card so that you can use an XY2100 digital commands for control and all that hardware is enclosed. All you have to really worry about with these systems is controls, focusing lenses, cables, and power, which is still a lot, <laughs> but it's significantly less than what you would have to think about with the open frame systems. Um, however, this does come at the cost of flexibility that I mentioned earlier. The packaged heads are the size that they are. You cannot make them smaller without removing all of the parts from the box. And at that point, you're right back to purchasing an open frame head. Uh, so what I've got here today is one of our open or package scan heads that I just took the cover off of. And you can see we've just got the two axis open frame head mounted in here. We've got the digital to analog receiver card. And then you've got the servo amplifiers right here. And all of that just goes right to the output. So that's what it looks like underneath the hood. Put that down to make sure I don't drop it. <laughs> So just like you can purchase two single axis units to integrate into your own two axis open frame system, you can then also purchase all of the components for a packaged head to build into your own system to get exactly the size and footprint you need. But it is another level of mechanical engineering that not every user wants to take on. If you don't want to do that work, then consider the packaged heads. If you want an analog system, but like the idea of a packaged head, we do do that as a special request. You would just need to get in touch with us and, and let us know sort of what configuration you're looking for, and we can work that up for you. Uh, this is also one of those places that I want to include the honorable mention for our, our Blink High Speed Focusing Assembly. If you are looking for a single axis system and the single axis that you wish to control is the Z axis, or if you are looking to build a three axis system from scratch, this is one of the options for Z axis focusing that we have. We can also do an open frame version of our larger three axis scan heads for builders who are looking for a more sophisticated integration. But this is a rather complex project. It's not right for everyone. And you really wanna make sure that you understand what you're taking on when you're talking about building a three axis package skin head from scratch it's uh it's not five minutes worth of work so just to be mindful of that uh so once you decide the form you want your system to take you get to start thinking about all of the finer details such as deciding on the optic and choosing a motor in many of my one-on-one -on -one conversations uh these questions that are here on the screen are the answers that I'm looking for when I say to you that phrase that I love, tell me about your application. Um, I encourage you strongly, take a screenshot of these questions because if you reach out to Thor Lab support or if we end up having a conversation, these are the questions I'm going to be asking you. And if you send over the answers in an initial inquiry, uh, you'll get the solution you're looking for a lot faster. The first two questions that we've got here are the critical ones for choosing the correct technical specifications. So the next few slides are gonna be about those. And the last three questions here are more food for thought, some items that you should just spend a little time contemplating. And if you can't answer these questions on your own, or if you have concerns about any of these, please feel free to include those questions when you reach out to us. Don't be, don't be shy. We're happy to talk about them. <laughs> and now next, I'm just gonna take a moment to, to play you guys a fun short video of an aluminum part that we were marking on in our lab. And we did this with one of our XG330Y1 three axis scan heads and a YAG laser, I wanna say it's a pretty low power YAG laser, 
But the z-axis controls are what allow us to maintain the focus spot size across the curvature and keep like that really crisp, consistent mark on the outer edges of the field. And uh, steel and aluminum parts uh, always spark nicely when you write on them. So, you know, fun times in the lab. <laughs> so now let's get into your light source parameters because that is a major concern when talking about Galvo systems. The parameters of your light source frequently have the largest impact when you're choosing a Galvo. And this is all about maintaining balance between an optic that's large enough to handle your laser beam from both a geometric and a power density standpoint, while at the same time being small enough to move as quickly as you need it to. Since these specifications are the driving force behind the choice of optic, I am going to spend a couple of slides on this topic. The first and easiest one is the mirror size. And that is determined by something that we touched on briefly at the beginning when we were talking about the parts of the system. And that's the beam diameter. I told you I'd get back to it. In case anyone came in late, the mirror size is not the actual dimensions of the optic, but refers to the diameter of the laser beam when it arrives at the galvan mirrors. There are several different methods for determining beam diameter. We use the one over E squared measurement. If you only have the full width half maximum or another measurement, just go ahead and send along what you have. We can always help you determine what the one over E squared diameter of your beam is. Uh, this is sometimes the same diameter um, as the output of your laser. But if the beam has gone through an expander or other conditioning optics, it may have changed in size slightly. Our recommendation is to always fill the mirror aperture when possible. And this accomplishes both reducing the beam density and it helps to reduce stress on the coating. So if you have a five millimeter beam and you're looking at a seven millimeter mirror and you can do something, you can get an expander in there to, to make that five millimeter beam a full seven millimeters. Perfect. As long as the seven millimeter moves fast enough to be able to do what you need it to. Additionally, we also always recommend that you choose the smallest optic that is safe for your application because smaller optics can be moved faster. And while not all applications are optimized for speed, I have seldom been asked, can you make this Galvo move just a little bit slower for me? Uh, but I get asked for faster Galvos all day long. So smaller, smaller is faster. And then the second part of the discussion talking about light source parameters is the coating. And there are three sort of subtopics that drive the coating decision. The first is the wavelength of your laser. Our coatings typically fall into one of two categories, narrowband or broadband. And then there are options for each of those available in the catalog, but we offer many, many, many coatings that are not available through the website but that we have short lead times on because we do keep the mirrors on the shelf. We're just limited on the number of SKUs that we have on the website. But we have the mirrors in stock. Um, other even more specialized coatings, if we don't have something in stock that works for you, are available upon request, as well as completely customized options, but custom optics can have a bit of a longer lead time. So that's just something that you should take into consideration when planning out a project that might require a custom co coating um, if the catalog options don't meet your needs, strongly recommend that you reach out to support. If you are not sure if your wavelength is covered by a coating, please reach out. The next two subtopics are quite closely related, and that's the power, typically in watts, of the laser, and then the mode of your laser, whether it's continuous wave or pulsed. If your laser is a CW, continuous wave laser, that's going to be the easiest calculation because you only need to consider the overall beam density. And there are numerous calculators that can be found on the website, including on thorlabs.com. Strong pitch for the home team <laughs> that you can use for determining beam density. Um, pulsed lasers 
can be a bit more difficult because the damage mechanism for pulsed lasers is quite different than what we see for continuous wave lasers. And for more information on how those different laser types damage optics, strong recommend that you check out the laser induced damage threshold tutorial page that is on thorlabs.com. If you can navigate to the optics handling and care tutorial that's on our technical resources page, you can find that there. I think that one is also going to be in the additional resources view on your screen. So you should be able to find it pretty easily. If your beam is too dense to be handled by the coating or substrate, we may recommend an alternative coating. There are some out there that are really durable. Also, an option to increase that would be expanding your beam and possibly going up a galvo size. Uh, in some cases, we might suggest an alternative substrate altogether if it's the substrate that could be concerned. So in the chart up here, you'll see that we do have some of our standard coding listings. But as I mentioned earlier, we have lots of resources available to us to obtain specialty or custom coatings. So let us know what those are. The damage thresholds, we get questions about that quite a lot. Well, what's the damage threshold on such and such a mirror? Um, some of our coatings can be found on the specs tab for our two axis package scan heads. We are working on getting those listed in other places. So uh, stay tuned for additional details. But in the meantime, if you have any questions about specific coatings, or if you aren't sure if a coating is going to work for your laser, please contact us with your laser parameters and we will help you make that determination. Now we get to move on to a big question. I saved the best one for last speed. Uh, I don't know if it's the best one. This is certainly the most frequently asked about topic. <laughs> um, it's far and away. The most commonly asked question we get is, how fast can I drive these gallows? And then I have to do that terrible thing where I answer your question <laughs> with another question, just super obnoxious. Or I have to do the equally frustrating, vague answer of, well, it depends. <laughs> um, there are several variables that go into determining the speed of a galvo. The most important two are the scan angle and the waveform. Scan angle is 100% as intuitive as you would anticipate it being. <laughs> Smaller angles can be moved faster. Basic laws of physics apply. Uh, we here at Thor Labs are good. We are not breaking the laws of physics good, although the femtosecond laser team comes close. They do really weird stuff with like, Love it, but real weird. Um, so after the overall scan angle, we are gonna to touch on the shape of the wave, waveform. Sine waves, nice gentle shapes, like the ones that are over here in this intended frequency box. Um, they can be driven the fastest. Triangle and sawtooth waves are going to be more aggressive and therefore slower because the galvo has to slow down at the top at the the ends of these movements in order to make those those tight corners and then the ones here on the bottom the square waves or step and settle types of movements are going to be dependent on not only the the size of the step but also how settled the mirror has to be for the particular application so the max speed of a square wave is going to be very closely related to the specification of small angle step response time. I am not going to get too in depth about step response or really much more in depth than just this because we would need an entire other webinar. <laughs> but if small angle step response is relevant to you, as I have said before, please reach out. If you are reaching out about speed, the best way to format that question is, I am looking to move a galvo at a frequency of number of Hertz with a scan angle of plus minus blank degrees, optical or mechanical, whatever's easiest for you, just let us know which one it is. And it's a sine wave or it's a triangle or whatever that, whatever your wave looks like. If you are potentially going to be using multiple scan angles or frequencies, just let us know what your most aggressive one is and we'll base our conversation off of that. 
And if you're sitting on the other end of this internet connection going, I don't know the frequency, I just need to know if I can move at a certain number of meters per second or whatever that is, then there are some also some other variables in that sort of a measurement that go into calculating how what your speed's going to be. And primarily that's going to be your working distance and the types of marks that you're that are being made, as well as your field size. Um, so here comes my favorite phrase again. Are you ready for it? If you reach out to support with your specifics, we can offer you some guidance that will help you choose the right product, or we can potentially even do some testing in our lab here for you to be sure that we can make the movements you're looking for with the Galvo system that you're most interested in. So if you say, hey, Carol, I need an XG215 and I'm looking to you know, mark this picture on, you know, whatever we can we can run that that testing for you and get you at least a better idea of what it would look like in a in a more real world environment as opposed to the world of math where everything always works <laughs> and i think that's it so i'm pretty sure i've covered a lot of topics today i've told you you need to reach back out to us but i think that's all i've got um Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to sit in and listen to me today. And oh, look at my cute little gallows in their in their little bins, waiting for mirrors. I love it. So uh, I'd be happy to take some questions at this point if anybody has any. Okay. okay. Thank you, Carol, for that really informative presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions, and again, if you've just thought of some more, I'd invite you to submit them in the Q and A tool. All right. So. Um, I think going back to one of your earlier slides where you're showing a laser marking system, uh, the question was, uh, what behavior could be expected if the input beam to the scan head is diverging or misaligned due to the beam expander, um, or in the beam expander example, what, what could you expect? So I'm going to make a brief comment that I, I don't think we hear too many customers struggling with that, so there definitely is a little bit of forgiveness if you can get it um, pretty well aligned with your system. Um, but uh, do you want to add to that, Carol? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to first note that, Brian, you don't hear about it because you're in engineering. <laughs> I assure you, as a support person, we hear about beam alignment issues. <laughs> no, I just. Um, the Beam alignment is definitely something that we run into. There are several strategies that you can take from a construction and mechanical standpoint to help mitigate issues of beam alignment. I will say that the two most common things that I see that are key indicators that you've got a misaligned beam are if you are getting significantly less laser power through the scan head output than you would expect to get because you're going to lose some amount of laser power on each optical surface, but you shouldn't be losing a ton. And if you are losing more than you realistically feel like you should be, your beam could be misaligned and it could be getting clipped off at some point. And the other way that we can sometimes tell, and this is one that is far more unfortunately, see, I do have a decent example here. So, um, all of our mirrors do get held into mounts. And if the beam is aligned in such a fashion that it is heating up, it is hitting the, the bottom mount of the mirror, you could end up in a situation where the, the adhesive that bonds the mirror into the mount gets heated by the laser because it absorbs too much of the laser energy. And you'll know that happens because your mirror will fall off. And that is, pretty noticeable but as brian did say we we don't hear a ton of instances of mirror alignment because usually you do you do notice when that's happening in a laser marking system pretty pretty quickly okay um yeah i'll just i'll just uh touch on the detail of the converging or diverging oh, if that's the I'm situation in yeah. the system then um, then yes, th this person who asked the question already alluded it to it in their question, which was um, there could be a small shift in where the focal plane exists. Um, so the optical designs are expecting 
uh, a certain optical geometry, but uh, in your system, if you think that might be particularly sensitive to that, then you may need to account for maybe a small Z adjustment or a way to uh, slightly uh, adjust the location of your workpiece uh, to account for that variation. Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's a pretty detailed one. Uh, touches on a top couple of the more complicated um, situations. So we're talking about a femto uh, laser. Mm. And um, I think the essence of the question is um, how many points can be scanned in one go? Is it possible to scan three axis using a two axis galvo? Um, and then some comment about Z path scan defining custom points. And then so. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So go ahead, but there is a there is another part to that, which is a separate question, so go ahead. Okay, I am typically good at answering one question at a time, but I will try and try and keep those in my brain because it does sound like the first two that you asked are going to be very, very closely related. So um, the maximum number of points, I think that you asked, the maximum number of yes. points that you could be scanned. So that is going to be very closely related to that speed question that I asked. So that is going to be a matter of, I'm assuming this is exactly what I was talking about when I said you're, this is a, a square wave. So this is going to be a move to a point, take a scan, move to a point, take a scan. So this is the, the waveform for this is going to look very much like a step and settle response. So it is going to either be back and forth squares along the same shape, or it's going to end up, the waveform is going to end up looking like a series of steps all the way up to the full excursion or whatever your maximum scan angle is and then back down. And so this is one of those ones that is going to be limited by the small angle step response time. And that's where you're going to need to determine how settled your mirror actually has to be. Galvo mirrors are never 100% settled, but you can get 99% uh, settled. And that's going to be the small angle step response time spec. But you can maybe improve upon that a little bit if say you only need your galvo mirror to be 90 percent settled or 80 or whatever the number that suits your application best is going to be if you do need it to be fully settled that full 99 percent then you're just going to have to be limited by the the small angle step response time because that's what that specification is pointing towards um, and there again also the maximum number of points is we would have to um you know graph that out with the number of points that you're looking to scale and your and your scan angle. And then I believe the second part of that was um, using a three three axis with a two axis system. Was that it? Um, yes. Okay. So maybe so, maybe just describe a little bit like what we mean by the third axis. So single axis, you're just scanning back and forth. If we imagine, you know, a, a plate or a piece of paper right here. And then for a two axis, you're doing an X and a Y. And for the third axis, if you were looking to scan X, Y, and then you wanted to scan something that was up here, this is going to be your Z. So it's more of a, a, a cube shape as opposed to just a square. And so if you're making an adjustment for the Z, or if you want to scan in that Z axis, you're going to have to have a way to control your focal distance. And that's where something like the Blink high-speed focusing unit comes into play. So you need something to control where your focal plane is at. And so you can't really do it with just a two axis system. You need to have something else in there that that compensates for for that Z. Okay. And, and, whether, part... and that could be that could also I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be something like the Z axis focuser. You could also do like a Z stage, but then of course, you're going to be moving out of the focal plane of your lens. Right. And the third part of that question, uh, are the Galvos compatible with micromanagers or do they come with custom software? So the Galvos are, so Galvos are very simple devices. I think they were invented in the mid 1800s. So, you know, a couple minutes before my time, but they are kind of, I mean, they're not smart devices. So they're analog. You can hook them into whatever, analog waveform generator or serial DAC kind of is out there that, that suits your needs. So they don't have custom software. There are several software packages out there that do exist 
specifically for programming Galvos with things like, um, you know, XY stages or programmable other other sorts of sort of like motion control devices or or micromanagers and we can certainly point you in the direction of those you may even already have access to one but those are sort of the things where you can um you can go in and you can write your own sort of code to get the system to do exactly what you want to do and you can do that in you know lab view or matlab or something similar okay um okay Here, here's a good one for you carol so let's say a customer by mistake touches the mirror and leaves some spots. Uh, what will will it affect the performance of the Galvo? In case yes, can it be recovered? So, um, if a customer touches a mirror, um, first off, we make them wear the cone of shame. But once they get the cone of shame off. Um, depending on how bad the damage is because there's varying scales if it's just a oh i touched it left a fingerprint on it noticed it right away um i would recommend that oh, this is one of those ones where uh the service guys are to gonna touch the mirror. yeah you don't, don't want to have to touch the mirror you really don't we we do have an optics care and cleaning tutorial but in particular some of the broadband metallic coatings like your protected silvers your enhanced aluminums your protected golds they are incredibly delicate coatings and even something as gentle as you know optical tissue or a swab that's specifically designed for use with optical coatings, it still can scratch those sorts of mirrors. So if, if the condition of your mirror is something that is critical to your application and somebody accidentally touches it and you're really worried about it, send it back to the barn and we'll clean it up for you. Um, if the, the, the way that the mirror is dirty isn't something like a fingerprint or it's, and it's just something like you've got dust or debris, you can blow that off using like op optical grade canned air, not the stuff you get from like Staples or the office supply store. This isn't for cleaning your keyboard. Um, optical grade stuff, you can get it from several places. I know 4Lab sells it, but there's a whole host of other vendors out there that sell really good clean canned air that you can get for blowing debris off of optics. Uh, but yeah, no, don't, don't touch the mirrors. Yeah, that's... That's, that's bad. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, this is a great question here. Um, where do we connect the signal generator function generator in the driver card? Does it have a BNC port? It does not. So that's where, when I was talking a little bit uh, at the beginning, where we were talking about the parts of the system and we were discussing cables, how I said that you could either make your own set of cables with the kit that comes with the open frame connectors, or you can purchase a ready-made set. So the ready-made sets that you get off of floorlabs.com, what they're gonna look like is they're gonna have one end that interfaces with the servo amplifier itself. And then the other end of that is going to be fly lead. So you can connect whatever kind of connector you want. If it's a BNC connector, you can do that. If it's some other, you know, more esoteric or less common sort of connector, you can just put one of those on there. Again, still no crimped, all soldered connections, use or uh, no clamps, all soldered connections. Make sure you use like a proper crimping tool. Make sure that the connections that you make are seal are, are, are shielded. Um, I'm sure there's something that I'm leaving out, but I can't think of it right now, but, um, but yeah, I, I know coming up soon-ish, we are going to have BNC cables for the servo amplifiers available on the website. It's just they haven't made their way through through all of all of the the varied paths to get make their way onto the website just yet. But that is something that is coming because we do get a lot of requests for BNC connectors. But for now, your best bet would probably be to pick up a set of the the pre-made cables and then go ahead and just affix your BNC connector to them. Okay. Um, are there some tutorials or books you might suggest to learn how to correctly align lasers to Galvo scan hits um, or, and or any help in troubleshooting misalignment of the laser? Ooh, that is an excellent question. So there's a few different things. So I'm certain there probably are resources on the web for checking and 
verifying beam alignment. I don't have any immediately in front of me that I can send your way, but if you wanted to reach out to us, I am certain that there are some, some other folks here that also have recommendations. It is likely that Thor Labs has a technical resource on that somewhere. I do know also a product that's on Thor Labs that I have found to be very useful. And this is one of those things that I wish I had known it existed nine years ago when I started. Uh, they do have these alignment cards that have small targets on them for various wavelengths. If you just go to thorlabs.com and you type in IR cards or viewing cards into the search bar, even just cards, they'll probably come up. So you can pick up something like that and that will help. And just keep in mind that those are for use with very low powers. You don't wanna you know, blast a hundred watts through one of those things, that'll be a bad day. But you can definitely check out those sorts of materials. And keep in mind that a lot of lasers do have a red alignment beam that is included in with the laser. At least I know a lot of marking lasers have that. Um, maybe less so in the imaging space, but definitely in, in the laser processing space, a lot of those lasers do come with an alignment beam. So that is somewhat helpful, although there is a little bit of a wavelength shift there as far as the location of the beam. So it's important to keep something like that in mind. Um, other than that, some of the some of the best solutions that I have ever found are some of the low tech ones. And I think the best one that I have ever seen was a post-it note with a cross drawn into the middle of it and slapped over the input aperture. And then shine your laser on it. Is it in the middle? Great, your beam's probably lined up. If it's not, okay. well, try again. <laughs> low tech have, solutions uh... sometimes work. All right, we have a few more really good questions I will try to get through here. Um, let's see, um, I think you already kind of covered this, but uh, in case it wasn't clear, uh, can I use a 20 millimeter commercial mirror for a 20 millimeter one over E squared collimated beam? Yes. Or do I have to use a bigger mirror to avoid heating? Nope. 20 millimeter mirrors are tw for 20 millimeter beams. You're good. Okay. Um, some commercial scan heads uh, come with correction files. So, so someone familiar with uh, 2D marking and F theta yeah. systems. Uh, is there some method or equipment to create correction files for the Thor Lab Scala systems? Yeah, absolutely. So there's definitely a method to create your own. Um, it's usually not just a process for the the correction file isn't necessarily married to the scan head it's usually a property of the scan lens so depending on what scan lens scan head combination you have we may already have existing correction files for that or the manufacturer may also have existing correction files for that. And usually once you have a correction file, even if it's something that's close, you can go in and make small modifications to it. You can you know, work with offsets. You can change digits slightly to make it perfect for just your scan head. Because of course, any correction file that you get is going to be again, made in that magical world of math where everything's perfect, but of course, in manufacturing, there are always going to be tolerances. So anything you get may vary slightly from perfect, and you can always go in and tweak your calibration files or your correction files, excuse me. And so we can certainly help you out with that process. And I'd be happy to talk to somebody about that if they have questions about making a correction file or um, you know, give them access to the resources that I have for getting those. We might already even have one kicking around in the couch cushion somewhere. Okay, uh, I got one question on how does the blink focus work if the beam is collimated? Um, I can take that and simply describe it. It's it's uh, it's usually part of a two optic system. So uh, there'll be a lens element in the focuser. Um, in, in our three axis systems, it's set up as a as an expander lens, and then there's a secondary fixed lens in the system that um, is the objective. So those two lenses uh, playing together where you can move one of them um, results in the ability to adjust the focus. And uh, I think the last one here for you, 
Carol, for 2D scanning, is the 3-axis galvo required to maintain focus over large XY regions? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. What was that? For 2D scanning, mm -hmm. is a 3-axis galvo required to maintain focus? So for 2-axis scanning over a over an XY region? I mean, it, oh, right. so yeah. in, in circumstances where you're dealing with a particularly large field size, maybe. <laughs> Again, that terrible, it depends answer. So for two axis scanning and for, for standard two axis systems, uh, F, F theta lenses are the sort of normal an F theta lens with a correction file is what's normally used to to get the the main to maintain the focus over the entire field. If you have a much larger field, then yeah, you may need to go up to a three axis system just so you get you can maintain that focus on the outer on the outer edges. Um, a normal sort of scanning field that's not corrected. Uh, again, check out the two axis versus three axis tab on the floorlabs.com three axis package scan heads page because it goes into this in detail. But if a, an uncorrected scan field with a three axis scan head looks kind of like a dish, um, and you can also end up with some dis distortions that field size and kind of ends up looking shaped like a potato chip. Everybody knows what shape a Pringle is, so you know what I mean. But these sorts of things will um, be compensated for with that Z axis along across larger fields. So sometimes a, a three axis or a, a Z axis focus shift to flatten that field is required if your field size is especially large. Um, this is one of those situ situations. Go ahead and reach out to us and we'll see if we can, if we have a suggestion for an F theta lens that can meet the field size that you're looking for. But if we don't, we can have the conversation about moving to uh, three axis. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Carol. I, I think we're, we're at our time limit here. Um, oh, did like we go the, over? Yeah, we're a few, few minutes over, but uh, there's a couple in here that were really technical, uh, looked like they needed okay. some math to solve. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely reach out and uh, we can deal with those uh, separately. Um, and if you have any other further questions, of course, um, reach out uh, to support, as Carol mentioned. Uh, so with that, Several I'd like times. to thank Carol <laughs> for the presentation. Our next webinar will be on March 1st on focusing on Silicon Photonic Integrated Circuits by guest speaker John Bowers from UC Santa Barbara. You can register for this event on our website at www.thorlabs.com slash webinars. And thank you very much for your attendance. And we hope to see you again soon.